Hello and welcome to this uh, very special little uh, video that I've got for you all. I'm here with Arheo, Peter Nicholson, and uh, he is the game director of Imperator Rome. So, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, yes, indeed. I'm uh, the game director on Imperator, and it's a pleasure to be here. Lovely. So, how long have you been working on this, the, the 2.0 Marius update? Uh, oh, well, so we probably started development shortly after the, uh, the last major update 1.5, the culture rework happened. So it's been, gosh, I can't even remember when that was. It's uh, six, maybe seven months. Yeah, how about we just we just dive right in and we go through the different features of uh, 2.0. And I guess we can start with maybe what what's your favorite feature that you've uh, that you've added in 2.0? There's a lot to choose from here. Um, I think, obviously, we've, we've got some pretty big uh, changes coming. There, there are all the military changes, um, there's the military traditions, there's, there's a whole host of things. But I think the, the thing I'm absolutely the, the most keen on in terms of, of what fits with the, the game's direction and vision is actually the technology change. Um, I think I've mentioned before that I see this game as a, a civilization builder. Uh, and it's it's taken a little while, I think, for that to disseminate throughout the community. The people asking, "Hey, what is a civilization builder? What does it mean? Uh, and, and how does Imperator become a civilization builder if it isn't one already?" And I think this is the the largest step we've taken towards being a civilization builder. It lets you really diversify and, and make your country totally unique in each playthrough. It adds a whole lot of customizability. Um, with the, you know, you can unlock modifiers as you choose, which you always cover the inventions, but we've, we've added this extra element of, of these keystone type uh, inventions, which give you varying effects. Some do something instant, like for example, here you, you have those uh, uh, tetras uh, being produced, you, you gain a navy, um, but some of them have more long lasting effects, like uh, changing character interactions, changing the way that you even play the game. And then we have a couple of more advanced ones, um, such as the, uh, yeah, for example, this, the uh, dictatorship. Uh, this, this can plunge you straight into a civil war, but uh, you know, you get a dictatorship out of it. This was previously a decision, and I think it makes a lot more sense having the steps split up into this and potentially going through a, a big conflict in order to get what you want. And then we've also got things in the civic tree, I think, with the mutually exclusive choices between rural and urban planning. This is something that you can you can only choose one of, and this is making a, a big choice in your playthrough if you want to make it. Do I get all these bonuses to my cities, or do I get what seemingly initially looks like a fairly you know, minor thing in comparison, but actually this doubles the building capacity of every single uh, settlement territory in the game. And that kind of thing, I think, is absolutely vital to the, the feeling of what a civilization builder really is. I, I will say, in my own campaigns, I have been tending towards rural planning over urban planning. Um, yeah. Because you've got quite a few territories like, I really need a mine here, because you know, the trade good in this region is really nice. Maybe it's some iron and I want more of it. But it also really needs a fort. Um, it's in that kind of choke point -y area. It really needs a fort. But now I can just have both of them, which is really key. I, I quite like that. Yeah, it's, it's a nice change. I think, again, this choice in particular is sort of making the decision between am I going to really build tall or am I going to build wide? and get the most out of my slaves and my, my territories. Right. I do like the addition of the keystone uh, inventions as well. Um, especially when, you you know, if, if you're playing as Rome, for example, you're starting with eight innovations to spend because of your the tech starting situation. So I, I do find myself at the very beginning of a campaign just trawling through them and saying, okay, how can I maximize my start. Can I maybe start off with some um, military artisans to get a free province investment and then maybe in uh, the civic advances I can maybe go down to you know, getting some uh, slave output or another uh, investment here. Um, just really trying to maximize the amount that I can make out of that initial boost of uh, inventions. So maybe we'll, we'll talk about, about the legions. 
Absolutely. The um, I mean, the cost of legions is, of course, the the main limiting factor. They are particularly in the early game. They they can be a real drain on your economy, which is uh, absolutely intentional. And I think when I'm playing, generally speaking, I, I tend to switch to legions. 50, 60 years in usually, uh, when I got to the point where I conquered my home region, maybe integrated a few cultures, I'm getting the most out of my levies, um, before I switch over to legions when I actually have the economy to support it. Of course, you don't have to do that. You, you can uh, really rush that uh, that legions law early on if you want to. Yeah, they, they do tend to be very, very expensive. So, along with legions, of course, we have the levy system as well. How how does this work? Because I've seen quite a lot of confusion about where it's pulling these pops from. Uh, are the pops sort of tracked? So, if you lose certain units, will the pops die? Like, how exactly does it function? So, the, the levy system is, is directly linked to the population makeup your governorships or your regions in this case. Here you can see in Italia we can raise 33 subunits or cohorts, uh, 17 light infantry, 8 heavy infantry, 5 uh, light cavalry and 3 support units. The support units are sort of added on top based on the size of the, the army that you're raising. Uh, they aren't uh, explicitly linked to pops. But the makeup of your um, of your levies is related to the culture of the pops that you're levying from. Now, for example, if you open the province view for Rome and put a mouse over the Roman culture there, the summary of the territory UI. Oh, the territory uh, UI in the culture, there it is. That's the one. Um, you can see this tooltip tells you that uh, you, you will get the following. Um, levies from pops of a Roman culture. Uh, this tooltip is something that we're actually aiming on improving a little bit because it's not immediately clear what the um, the link between pop type and subunit is. But I think in this case, it's uh, it's the case that your your freemen provide you with light infantry. Uh, your citizens provide you with uh, a, a, a mixture between light and heavy uh, light cavalry and heavy infantry. And your nobles, your equites, um, your equites essentially provide you with uh, light cavalry only. Gotcha. And that applies to every integrated culture that you have in your governorship. So if you were to conquer Sabinia and integrate that culture, or integrate the Sabellian culture, for example, you might get slightly different levies. The the makeup for each um, each culture can be different. They aren't in all cases. Sometimes they fall back to culture group. Uh, if we didn't, didn't know uh, exactly what sort of things they would have used, or we, we couldn't make an educated guess. But in most cases, I think every individual culture has its own, um, its own makeup. Here you've got your chariots from presumably nobles, um, heavy infantry from citizens, and light infantry from uh, freemen, again. Now it's worth noting here that you cannot levy slaves. So the, the more of your economy devoted to slaves and, and building up tax, the fewer actual levies we have to raise. Gotcha. So every single culture, or I guess the, the majority of cultures, will have some kind of unique way of splitting up the 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 amount of levies or the, the breakup of the, the units that you get, which I do yeah. find quite interesting. And you'd be able to really say, oh, I really want to have lots of horse archers, say, in my uh, my levies, so maybe I'll go over and I'll have a look at maybe integrating some Scythians who have like 30% of them. So. Absolutely, and I think the main way that you will be changing the composition of your levies beyond growth pops is going to be choosing which of your, uh, which of your cultures you integrate. I wonder who has the best, in your opinion, breakup of, of units? It's probably the Scythian cultures if you value horse archers. Uh, the Greeks tend to produce a fair amount of heavy infantry, so that can be pretty powerful too. Uh, but on the whole, levy quality, the quality of levy troops is going to be far less than that of legions who come with various associated bonuses, such as discipline, simply by virtue of being professional trained troops. I can load up one of my previous campaigns and we can have a look at... Um... 
a little bit of a, a lake or a game legion and see some of the uh, the cool little features that you get with your legions. So I have two here, Legio Italia and Legio Magna Gratia. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've built them in a way that I understand the game worked previously. So I, I build quite a lot of heavy infantry, uh, some cavalry, and uh, I've started using a few engineers as well, just to, to see how they work. Um, but I have found that these armies do tend to be very powerful. So uh, what exactly is it that makes the legions just that much better? It's probably the addition of the Legion Honours and Distinctions <clears throat> that you can see up at the top there. Um, the first Legion that you raise in your country gain uh, the Primogenia uh, Distinction, which sort of sets them apart from the other Legions you raise, gives them a little bit of history. And of course you can see the history here in the, uh, the sub-menu. Uh, there's all sorts of different history entries you can get from looting cities to... Um, things that your generals and your tribunes will actually do. Um, and I think that adds a nice uh, a nice bit of immersion to the feeling of using these over levies. But the, the actual combat bonuses, the differences, are these distinctions that you earn. And these are earned based largely upon in-game actions, uh, tied to the Heirs of Alexander DLC, um, that your legions will undergo. Maybe they take part in a particularly grueling battle, a major battle, and they'll earn some uh, distinction. Maybe they fight in a plains province or a marsh, jungle or forest province and gain the Insidiatrix uh, distinction, for example, and these can give them localized bonuses. Uh, and these are permanent, so any units you raise within this legion will benefit from those distinctions. And it's, it's not all good things, is it? Uh, there are some negative would you still call, you wouldn't really call them honours, but there are some negative uh, modifiers as well that you can earn. Uh, Absolutely, the, the dishonours, for example. Yeah, we've got one here. So you've uh, presumably sacked a temple of your own religion somewhere, which has uh, left a permanent stain on the honour of this, this legion and the commander of this legion, who is now going to suffer a prestige dip as well as reduced seal. Yeah, he, um, well, it was necessary. Let's just put it that way. It always is. Yeah, they, they stole my holy site. <laughs> uh, but yeah. There is uh, coincidentally actually a, a, a keystone invention in the religious tree, I believe, that uh, quite radically alters the the fabric of the game. Uh, Malignant Epicureanism. We've got a few of these ahistorical um, inventions that we've added. Uh, which maybe radically change how you're going to be playing the game, for example. It's, oh, that's um, very interesting. These, these are a bit of an experiment, but something that I think can really add a lot to playthroughs. Um, this radically tanks your omen power. Your omens will be mostly useless if you take this invention, and this is something that you can't back out of once you've taken it. However, as you can see, when activated, desecrating temples, any temples, now restores 10 stability instantly. There's a few other examples of similar uh, inventions where it will it will have a radical change to your gameplay, but it'll, it'll give you uh, the potential to get something really great out of it. That is something I had not seen yet. Um, like I said, there are quite a lot of ideas, and I'm not the kind of person to just troll through every single one and plan my route through. Um, but yeah, seeing that one, I'm I'm tempted. I've got to say, I am tempted. It's it's a it's certainly a choice. It is, and we've aimed to include some of those more radical choices if you want to head down that way. That sort of thing never appears in uh, in the tree that requires you to, to to get it in order to get something else. These are always branch offshoots, so you're never forced into these decisions that are going to uh, damage uh, stats in your country. Gotcha. Uh, that's nice to know, at least. I'd love to see more of those. But, uh, yeah. They're very, good. And they're very moddable as well. Um, the, the trees themselves lay, lay themselves out automatically, uh, which can result in a little bit of jankiness, as you can see at the bottom of the religious tree, but on the whole, it's, it's pretty solid. And all you have to do is script a new invention, uh, give it some prerequisites, and it will appear in the tree. So for modders, this should be very accessible, and you can do pretty much anything you want with this. Delightful. 
On the topic of modding, is there more tools then that have been added to the, the toolbox for modders uh, to really, you know, customize the game in the way they want it? I'd say so, yes. Um, I'd say these tree structured inventions are the big one, honestly, but we of course have the same system for military traditions now. Um, and we've added uh, a lot of on activate effect blocks to things such as traditions and innovations that allow you to run arbitrary script effects during them. So provided you can work your way around the script system when you adopt an invention, or when you adopt a military tradition, there is no reason that you can't perform any script that you might encounter in an event or in an interaction through that. Lovely. You mentioned traditions. Uh, these, have, these have changed quite a bit as well, I can see. Uh, specifically in that you can now jump between different cultures, traditions. So for example here, as I'm playing as Rome, I took uh, Embrace Italo-Greek Influence, which allowed me to go into Greek Peleus and Greek Kingdom traditions. Though I haven't taken anything there just yet. Um, do you want to talk a bit about why this change was made, I guess? Sure, so this is something that I've been wanting for a while. The um, previous military tradition system uh, was quite powerful, but it had a very limited scope and you were very railroaded into where you started and um, what you started with. And that, I think, didn't really fit with the, I'm going to say it again, the civilization builder uh, aspect of how I see Imperato. This allows you, with, uh, with some conditions fulfilled, to build your nation any way you see fit. Of course, it does require that gameplay buy-in. If you start in India and you want to uh, adopt the, I don't know, the Britannic traditions uh, of the, the British Isles, then you're not going to simply be able to grab them straight away. You, you need to have cultures of the right kind integrated. There needs to be some logical reason why your country would have adopted the Britannic traditions. And in this case, that is by encountering and integrating a fairly sizable culture of the appropriate type. And there are many of those linked by culture group to the cultural traditions. Uh, the more common ones, as you say, are things like Rome adopting Greek Peleus traditions, uh, Greece going the other way around, and then perhaps uh, in investing in Levantine traditions if they uh, conquered some of Syria. Right, folks. So, uh, say I, I am I'm playing as Rome, the way that I could I could potentially go and take Persian traditions if I conquer in the right direction, integrate the correct cultures, and have enough military tradition to actually make that path work. Uh, that seems very, very powerful if you uh, if you work it right. Getting all of the different bonuses maybe for your heavy infantry, um, taking every culture, trying to piece together the, the most powerful army. I, I, I can see that being used somewhat by some people. It may be, um, and that is something that I think we will have to monitor as far as balance is concerned, but particularly in things like multiplayer, I think this really gives you a reason to fight over specific regions. If you really want the, the Levantine traditions, then you need to get Levantine land, you need to get Levantine pops, and you need to fight over that, uh, that region in order to be able to unlock them. you got to get them camels, don't you? I suppose as Absolutely. well, the, the Levantine will also have uh, different levies as well for you to take. Uh, so maybe yeah, that's exactly. another reason that you'd want to go down and grab some of those. Yeah, and we've tried to limit uh, the cohorts that levies use to not, uh, not quite as much variety as things like legions. You won't often encounter levied troops that can raise elephants, for example, although I think there are some in India that can. I was thinking maybe the uh, the Carthaginians, uh, is it Massilian, um, they can also raise elephants as well. But I guess that had just come yeah, from their it's... noble pops, which as a tribe they're probably not going to have too many of. Exactly, and they have a very small percentage raised per pop type as well, so they will be rare. And the advantage of legions, or another advantage of legions, is of course being able to essentially do what you want with the composition of your armies. It's, it's powerful but expensive. Lovely. So other changes that I've I've noticed as well, being things like the way that the AI have really changed the way that they like to conquer things. Um, for example, we can see Egypt really going hard into 
um, into Anatolia. Before this happened, Thrace owned all of Anatolia. There's There's been a lot of changes to the way that AI likes to choose conquests. You want to talk maybe a bit about that as well? Sure. So uh, that's right. Um, we've done. We've made a lot of changes to the way I the way AI evaluates uh, who they go to war with. Mostly, um, they're a lot more keen in 2.0 to follow things like mission trees, to follow conquest, but also they're a lot less keen on conquering uh, nations of a, of a government type that perhaps differs from their own. So. Monarchies and republics um, will be a lot less keen to take a deep dive into tribal territory if it doesn't directly benefit them, i.e. if uh, they don't have claims and if it isn't in their mission tree, they will tend not to do that. It's not an absolute rule, but it will still happen sometimes, uh, of course, but we can't uh, railroad history too much. Yeah, I, I have seen it being much improved in that area, for sure, uh, especially things like we won't see... or. It's much, much less likely to see, I should say, uh, the Roman Empire just going to conquer Germania, completely ignoring Greece and North Africa and that sort of thing, which is certainly nice to see. Yeah, and from a direction perspective, I think it's a little bit of a shift away from having the AI play optimally, um, whereas previously the AI would make safe conquests, um, it would make easy conquests, it would try and grab as much land as it could for the littlest effort it possibly could, that often resulted in a situation that just didn't really make sense historically. The, the Wars of the Diatakai would not really happen organically because an Egypt fighting a similarly uh, powerful Seleucid Empire just didn't rate very highly in the, uh, in the calculations. Whereas now they're, they're keener to engage in these sort of great power wars, so this is why you end up with Egypt uh, having invaded Anatolia. The Seleucid Empire is having a very bad day over there. Uh, and we even get things like the Marias um, starting to look outside of uh, India. They are unbelievably scary. I do not want to fight them in this campaign. Not, not for a while at least. Um, there are other other things as well, uh, of course. Uh, we I think did we touch on the Atlas mode um, earlier, uh, which I absolutely love. I think this is absolutely beautiful the way that you, this this map mode works. How did you come up with this? When what was the thought process of oh we're going to add a map mode that you're probably never going to use in a, in, in gameplay, but I want to see your pretty pictures, I guess. I was reading an atlas, uh, an online atlas book on old 19th century German um, maps. And of course the, the Germans in the 19th century took cartography very seriously. So there are huge, abundant amount of uh, resources of um, maps of antiquity, uh, maps of the Middle Ages, etc. And they all have this very distinct appearance. Uh, and I just, I, I thought I was just experimenting one day. I want to try and replicate that. I want to see what it might look like. It might not be um, very historical, but of course the whole, you know, there is a suspension of disbelief required when looking at a grand strategy map anyway. Mapping in the, the Roman era was very, very imprecise, as we know from, from some of the early maps. But I, uh, I started experimenting with this and the the colors came out pretty much to my um, satisfaction it, it, it has that sort of slightly antiquated papery feeling to it uh, and then we, we just took it a, a couple of steps further and started adding in these um, responsive uh, zoom uh, zoom responsive uh, widgets for cities and so forth i think you have to have a tag selected uh, maybe you can't turn the ui off yeah, they disappear when the uh, when the UI is turned off. Which oh, I'm, that's a shame. I kind of think I'm okay with that. I mean, it would be nice to have them, I guess, but uh, it's also nice to just have if you just want the map with nothing else on it. Like I, I do think that looks real nice too. It does. It does still look very good. Um, but often on these these German maps, they they would use uh, a lot of. Um, icons and representative legends to indicate what a certain thing was. Now, this isn't a one-to-one -one representation, but with what we had, we were able to add these widgets that show you uh, 
where your larger cities are. Uh, we can scale the size of the uh, the icon, the star icon, depending on the size of the city in relation to uh, to other cities. And then you have these unique ones for holy sites and other things. And then, of course, the the real nice to have feature here was the roads, which I think adds a lot to it because I think there's nothing more satisfying than turning this on at the end of your campaign and being able to see exactly the outcome of how you played and where you built and what you did just displayed on a map because after all i mean we all map stare when yeah. we're playing paradox games we do as a as a culture of of map staring experts do do quite like our maps indeed uh, i will say you may not have uh, intended it as a uh, gameplay tool but specifically for the road building i have this map open quite a lot uh, of interest then is that it's fairly simple and fairly trivial, in fact, to to mod this into other map modes. So, for example, if you wanted the political map mode to display roads, I think that's a one line change in the map modes file. That's good to know. That's very good to know. And then back to I I, I tend to use political map mode. I'm I'm told that I'm a heretic for it, and I should be using terrain map mode, but. Oh, this is the subject of a long-standing debate, uh, largely <laughs> between between art and design. Which one should we use? Which one do we use? Uh, I tend to use both terrain and and political at varying times. Um, I, I have some questions from uh, from the community. I put out a post asking for some questions. So, uh, if you like, we can go through those. Or is there something in specific that you would like to show off first? Uh, I think we can we can dive into some questions. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, to start with, um, two point the Marius update was styled as the the Autumn of War uh, back in the roadmap that we got. Um, but while we've got the addition of legions and levies and the introduction of combat with as well, uh, the ways in which combat happens hasn't been radically altered at all. Is it something that you wanted to touch on but found no time, or are you happy now with the way that combat works? I think it's something that we can iterate on. Um... It remains reliable, but it hasn't changed a whole lot uh, from previous iterations of Paradox Games. It's very similar to European Universalis and EU Rome. Um, it wasn't in my roadmap for the Autumn of War. This was intended to focus on a sort of large-scale warfare part of the game um, and not specifically touch on the mechanics of combat. I think at the end of the day, well, you can do a lot to make combat more visually or uh, conceptually appealing. Uh, at the end of the day, it is going to be a grand strategy game where you're you're watching your armies fight without any input from yourself. So it doesn't have a as as high of a priority to me personally. Okay. Uh, on a similar note, for the for armies and the way that they work, um, we had the introduction of food for armies. Uh, it's meant that it's relatively rare for armies to take attrition, leading to quite a lot more manpower, uh, to the point where, in previous versions of um, Imperator 1.5 and such, manpower has seemed to eventually become somewhat of an irrelevance. Has 2.0 addressed that in any way? To an extent. Um, we've made quite a few changes to the manpower pool. Um, it's no longer a I think 20 or 30 year recovery period. So you'll find that you recover manpower quicker but can store less of it. Um, I would say that there is still probably that tipping point where manpower becomes less of an issue to you. Um, but this wasn't something that we specifically set out to change. Manpower is still required by virtue of having the levies and legion system working together. Right. Um, so with the introduction of the engineer unit, were there any thoughts about maybe making it useful in combat as well, other than being able to cross uh, straits and rivers without penalty? Uh, for instance, maybe having them work as some kind of artillery unit, uh, as the Romans were quite famous for using like the scorpion in battles? This wasn't something fairly that high up on the agenda. I think, the, the as you mentioned, the crossing rivers... Uh, without penalty was already a very significant change. I think that's likely to see a lot of use in multiplayer, for example. 
Uh, and the effect on sieges is, of course, very significant. So giving them another role, I think, would be probably overkill. So, uh, the renaming of cities. Why can't we do it, and, and can we have a final nail in the coffin of, of, of why it's not a thing? Um, because I don't like it. But Alexander Which is not did. a very satisfactory answer. <laughs> um, it's, it's something I've always been slightly to one side of the fence on. I think it is... It makes a lot of sense, especially when you're founding cities, to be able to name them yourself as the great kings did. Um, and what you do in your own game is, of course, up to you. Uh, but I've, I've always been quite fond of having a superficially historical looking world. And I think that adds more to the immersion than being able to name your cities uh, would. But it's it's a debate to be had, I think. So you you don't you don't find any charm in in having um, a, a new city named after yourself, Arheopolis? I do. Um, that would of course be excellent, and everybody should name their city Arheopolis. We're going to have to but... be able to rename cities for that to happen. Indeed, indeed. Um, I'm, I'm still thinking on that one. Maybe someday we've let you uh, rename various things, units, uh, legions you can rename, uh, children you can rename. We haven't quite got to cities yet, and I'm not yet sure about that one. Uh, renaming the Grand Nations would be the logical next step, and that's something that I don't think I would ever go for. I, I don't want to see Rome renamed to something that just doesn't fit with the immersion of the period. Okay, well, I, I suppose that is as as good an answer as the people are going to get. Uh, I Great, think, sir. I, I think they are wanting, oh yes, we'll add this immediately, but uh, maybe eventually is, is good enough for now, I guess. Yeah, not this time is the answer. Right. Um, so the way that navies fought as well, that was changed, um, I believe in 1.1, the Pompey patch. Um, is there any changes in 2.0, or has that been, um, is that something that maybe would be changed in the future as well? Uh, there are no major changes to the way navies operate in 2.0, though they have uh, benefited from the combat width changes we made. You'll find that the combat width in uh, inland sea versus open sea, I think, is different, and the combat width in traversable rivers is also a lot lower than it would be in the open sea. Uh, aside from that, there are no major changes, I don't think. Uh, possibly some balanced tweaks, if I recall correctly. Um, in the future, who knows? Uh, I think we could have certainly done more with the naval system. It's something that I think should have a large impact on uh, peacetime gameplay as well as warfare. But who knows? Okay. Can we expect more unique government types and more mechanics to distinguish between the plethora of tribal nations? Um, again, I can't really answer on, on what you will be getting, but I think if we were going to change anything with government types, it would be adding unique mechanics to the ones that exist and maybe letting you specialize between those rather than adding unique government types uh, per se. Okay. Um, on national ideas, are you happy with how they work right now, having the two positive and one negative uh, aspect of them? No, not really. Um, they are a very old system. They do fulfill the, the direction requirement, if you will, of letting you customize, which I think is always good. But I don't think they go really far enough, and I think a lot of their versatility and uniqueness has been superseded by the technology system. So a, a change is, is possibly coming in that direction? Possibly. Um, again, I can't say much about For, for sure. Plans. Just hearing you say I can't say is probably going to be enough for some people, though. I'm sure it will be. People do like to speculate. So, um, 
A question that I, I feel you've you've answered already, but I will ask it again anyway. Um, so, Crusader Kings is all about characters and dynasties, EU4 is about trade and colonizing, and Stellaris is about like exploration. What do you feel are the central themes to Imperator Rome, and how committed are you to fleshing these out? Yeah, I've touched on this uh, a couple of times, maybe. Um, it's a civilization build, and, and what that means to me is that you can start with a more or less blank slate. The map is, of course, not symmetrical. There are plenty of asymmetric um, starts. You have the huge Diatokai nations, and you have tiny tribes, and you're anywhere, anywhere in between. But on top of that, it's important to me that you're able to construct the gameplay experience that you want, the civilization that you want. You can build wonders now, you can uh, adopt different inventions, you can take an entirely different path through the military innovations of the period if you invest into doing so. And I think it's it's hit that sweet spot where we're, we're getting there as far as the civilization build aspect is concerned. Um, I think perspective, again, is an important thing to bring up when talking about what the what the player fantasy is expected to be. As you've said, Crusader Kings is a, a character game. It's it's more, more like a grand strategy RPG. Um, for Imperator, I I like to think of it more that you're you're not playing your country directly. You are playing the government in charge of your country. You, you're playing the governing body that rules your nation through the ages. Um, the makeup of that government may change, how it looks, that might change. Uh, the effects it has might ultimately change, but you are the governing spirit. And this is one reason that I feel really important, uh, really strongly about um, civil wars and how if you lose your civil war, the game absolutely should end. You as a government have failed in your duty to safeguard your people. Somebody has seized power and you have lost the game. Yeah, I don't think it should be something that you can necessarily game. But I, that said, I do. I'm, I'm fond, of perhaps, of the approach that we're taking in the invention tree, where you have to undergo a civil war in order to get what you want. So you're using that as a means to improve your nation. You're making a, a difficult choice that plunges your country into turmoil. But when you get out the other side, you'll be stronger for it or different for it. I, I got to say that I love the that implementation because well the the biggest example we have is Rome went from a republic to an empire and the way they got there was through a big old civil war um, so I definitely can see the the benefits of that and I, I do I do very much like it not to hear it I, well, I, I mean as you can see with uh, with this campaign that I've gone open at the moment, I am indeed the Roman Empire. That was a, a tough civil war, let's put it that way. As it should be, I think. Um, and I'm quite happy with the way that that scales um, quite prettily based on the stability of your nation when you undergo the, uh, the, the invention decision to, to actually activate the civil war. For sure. Uh, so, moving on to the trading system. Um, are we happy with the way that it's working now? Is there any ideas you maybe have for for revamping things or i know that's a, again a question that you can't really say an answer to but maybe to talk about the the trading system as it works now uh is it something that we're we're happy with right now um trade was not the focus of the 2.0 update as i think most people understand um that said what we've tried to do over the course of the last couple of updates is add small quality of life features to the trading system to make it a little easier and, and more sensible to use. Um, in this case, handing off control of provincial trade to your governor is now a setting that you can turn on, which I think will make a lot of people happier and it, it certainly takes a lot of the micromanagement away from running a larger empire when you have other things to concentrate on. Trade itself, um, it's better than where it was at 1.0, um, but I don't think it has enough uh, impact yet. And I think it could do more in terms of peacetime mechanics. I won't uh, bandy words there. I think it could be better. Uh, so uh, a while back, uh, it was noted that the, there was a rework of the vassal mechanics. Uh, this was dropped, but is that something that you are you're going to be holding back for a future update and we 
we'll probably see that in maybe the next or the one after that updates. Again, it'll have to be an unsatisfying answer. Um, it was too much for the patch it was in. I think it was the 1.5 update that we were initially planning that. Um, it didn't fit into the, uh, the schedule for either that update or this one. Um, so that hasn't made it in this time. And I can't give you any indication as to whether you'll see that again. Okay, so to move on to the uh, the history tab for for the legions, we've just gone over that and you know noticed how it's really quite good for immersion. You're able to see exactly what your uh, armies have done throughout the campaign. Uh, what do you think of the idea for adding something similar for characters to give us more of an impression of their exploits and maybe remind us why we think that guy over there is a, is not someone we want to be friends with. It's been contemplated, and in fact the Legion history itself was inspired by the, uh, the character history in EU Rome, um, which I think was very similar to this. It uh, kept a record of things the characters had done, what they were up to, um, decisions they'd made, uh, choices they'd made, uh, that sort of thing, but ultimately it was very computationally expensive, or memory expensive, to hold that information around in a, a save game. I doubt we will ever get to see it on characters when the amount of characters that we have is uh, as high as it is. I think it, uh, it, it hits um, twelve to 15,000 in most games. Um, and, and having a, a history uh, associated with each of those, while possible, is a bit of a technical challenge. So you mentioned on the forums that you want navies to have other purposes than naval dominance. Um, what is it that you were thinking of uh, when you said that? Um, maybe something trade-related? I think that would make sense. Um, navies, especially naval powers like uh, Carthage, had uh, a lot of income associated with the size and prowess of their navies. And that wasn't all due to sinking other people's boats, protectionism, it was trade. And there's a lot of um, things we can look into for that, but I think trade is the obvious choice, yes. Uh, a very common question I have seen a lot of is, um, are you ever going to add more start dates? No. And as a follow-on, any thoughts on an extension to the end of the game? That's uh, more feasible, but again, I can't promise anything. I, I completely empathize with people that, would, that want more start dates, but the amount of work that goes into them is gargantuan compared to the, uh, the use that it gets. Which game system redesign turned out to be the best, in your opinion, and which one are you least happy with? Uh, the best, I think... Um... I think that's actually probably the culture rework. That set the scene for a huge amount of additional uh, interaction with other systems that was intended from the start. Uh, it has knock-on effects on happiness. It has knock-on effects on production. It now has knock-on effects on, on the very fabric of your military through the levies and legion system. It interacts with just about everything. And it's quite versatile in, in how you use it. And honestly, I think it gives your nation a character which it didn't previously have. The uh, the old method of simply converting everybody to your culture um, never really struck me as as satisfying. So I'm I'm probably happiest with that. Uh, followed closely by the inventions rework in 2.0. I think that's that's really a step in, in the right direction. Um, will we see small ships and wagons on trade routes like on the map, like in EU4? That would be quite nice for immersion. I agree. It would. It would be great. But another another case of can't really talk about future updates again. Indeed. Um, are roads and infrastructure going to get additional bonuses other than just army speed, or would would you like them to have more bonuses than just army speed? Uh, possibly. Uh, I think it would be ideal if they had more of an infrastructural purpose beyond army speed and applying the occasional modifier. Um, 
doing that is both a design and technical challenge, I think. Um, so if we were to do something like that, it would have to be a pretty big deal. Um, what pros and cons uh, are considered for an open beta, and why did they feel? Uh, why did you feel that a major update like the 2.0 Marius uh, update uh, didn't need one? Um, how was the experience with the first open beta that we had? I believe for 1.2 Cicero. Uh, I can't answer all of that question, but I can answer the latter part, and that is that. I think the the Cicero open beta was incredibly useful for us, um, and I think it really changed the way that we interact with our community on on the Imperato project, at least. Um, I really do enjoy having the frank communication with uh, with our core fans that we do um, as a, a thing that I, I constantly say I think is that if you make a suggestion on the forums for example it will be read uh, no matter how good bad thought through or unthought through it is it'll be read it'll be considered and in many cases we put some of those things into practice uh, there's no shortage of ideas and i think that is great and there's no shortage of feedback um which is also fantastic and that is a culture that i think we really have to lean into um i think it's part of what makes paradox unique and i really think as a, as a player which i was for many years before working for paradox it's something that attracted me to paradox games in the first place are you happy with the way that families are implemented right now and do you have any thoughts on making it a bit more in-depth? I'm relatively happy with it. I... Imperato is not a game of characters. It has characters, and I think it should stay that way. Um, there are quirks to the system, of course, and I think that there can be perhaps a better attempt at integrating them with the other systems as we've, we've done with cultures and religions and, and levies. I think one of the great advantages of this game is how interconnected everything is. And families perhaps short, fall a little short there. Um, but overall, I think they have the right amount of uh, player input that you need from them. They don't take away too much uh, investment of time and uh, resources into that specific system that doesn't really interconnect with anything uh, vital. So. Yes and no. Gotcha. Uh, what do you think about global event-triggered incidents that would affect large regions with multiple factions, like huge migratory invasions or flooding of major rivers, uh, some drastic events that can suddenly change the situation on the map? So this is uh, something I feel fairly strongly about. Um, one of the things we've really tried to do in 2.0 is get a lot more regional narrative into the game. Um, you will have noticed, I think, if you've played through the, the first 20 or 30 years so far, that the uh, the Wars of the Diadokai are a significant, important event uh, that the whole world can see the fallout of. And that, I think, is is super important. It's it's like the um, Burgundian inheritance in EU4. It's uh, something that is guaranteed to happen, but it may not always turn out in the same way. And I think it sets the scene for what happens with the rest of the game in a way that uh, didn't really exist before. So I think they're a very good thing to have. And, um, we've tried to add as much of that as possible in the 2.0 update. As you can see here, we have a fairly chunky path here, and that is another um, event which uh, can occur to give you a bit of regional flavor to this part of the map. I really like the idea of the sort of end game Diadokai missions um, that we've had added with, I think that's coming in Heirs of Alexander, um, yes. as it creates sort of like a final challenge for the campaign. Is there any interest in making more in this style, perhaps focused on uh, things like creating the dictatorships or imperial cults? I think they make a very satisfying um, cornerstone, um, capstone if you will, to, to a campaign as you say. Um, so I don't see why not. It's uh, it's something that's very satisfying to play through, and I know that uh, a lot of the people who've played the game so far have said similar things. So I think it's it's quite likely, yes. 
Um, and finally, uh, what do the new colors mean uh, for the UI? So we've got the the red and cyan. Do they have any meaning, or do they simply just fit into the ancient era? Uh, there's no specific meaning to these. These were things that we wanted to experiment a lot with, and, and we settled on these after a, a fair few rounds of experimentation. One of the things that I was absolutely keen to retain, though, was the, the light feel of the UI. Previously, it was marble, um, and I think it sets us apart from uh, from our sister titles, Crusader Kings has a very very dark theme and, and looks fantastic in, in that regard. But I think the light theme for Imperator was was part of its defining identity, and I didn't want to change that too much. So we needed colours that would augment that, and these two seem to fit the bill quite well. The red, obviously, um, related to Rome, and the the teal just uh, augmented that perfectly. Lovely. Well, that's all the, the questions that I have for you. Um, is there anything that you would like to say to um, the community um, in regards to 2.0? Um, enjoy it, I hope. And I, I really hope you enjoy it. We've put a lot, of, um, a lot of love into this update. So I hope it is what you desire. And regardless, do let us know. Um, I think I've already mentioned that we take community feedback, community criticisms, community review incredibly seriously. Um, and it's it's a wonder to, to pop on the forums every day and read the multiple new threads and new replies to all sorts of issues from minor to major just to see what people have to say. And I think it's fantastic that the community is so vocal about these things. So thank you. That's lovely to hear. Um, for sure, I I think I've I've been fairly prolific as well in giving my own feedbacks and disdain for mega cities is is a pretty pretty big one for me. Um, well, perhaps you can answer a question for me then. Are they dead? <laughs> mega cities, as far as I can tell, they be dead, and that makes me very happy. <laughs> there we go then. <laughs> Um, I'm sure somebody will find a way to... Oh, to absolutely. Just... Well, I'm not a meta player. Um, I, I do prefer the, the roleplay aspects. So if somebody is going to find a way to make the Mega City, it's not going to be me. Um, but from what I can tell, sure, you can still make really big cities, but they are not going to be all-powerful, all-encompassing. You need to build this, otherwise you are going to lose multiplayer. Um, that part of it seems to be gone, and yeah, that makes me quite happy. And I think the most important thing here is that the Atlas map mode won't look nearly as interesting if you only have one big city. Oh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, that is, that's, I guess, all I have for you. So, uh, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about Imperator 2.0. I'm really enjoying it. I think definitely people should give Imperator another try if they've uh, maybe put it aside after uh, the launch or um, or at any point just just give it another try it's radically changed and it's worth it's worth it for sure uh, but yeah thank you so much for coming on to talk to me thank you very much for having me it's been a pleasure lovely all right thank you very much and uh, goodbye goodbye